but it is my pleasure to introduce Crohn's and Colitis Canada's President and CEO, Lori Radke. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Radke, and I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, since I joined the organization, I've heard from many people connected to our cause. And I'd have to say these conversations have been really valuable to me. I've enjoyed learning more about people's experiences, their ideas and their aspirations for our organization. And as many of you know, we've undertaken a new strategic planning journey, which includes significant input gathered through focus groups, through surveys and individual conversations. Thanks to those of you who completed the survey, we had a really strong response. We're now taking all of this input and developing our path forward. And we look forward to providing you with an update on our strategic plan later this spring. This path, of course, builds on what we've learned and achieved over the past few years. Thanks to you and the resilience of our community last year, we were able to fund eight new research grants. We doubled the number of IBD scholarships given and we helped thousands through educational resources, support programs, and advocacy efforts. We're making an impact. Our COVID-19 and IBD experts continued their comprehensive efforts in providing guidance through online resources and through these webinars. We're now at number 30. Looking ahead, there's a lot happening in the next few months. Now is the time to register for our annual Gutsy Walk, which will be a very impactful day. Community walks will be happening all across the country on Sunday, June 5th. We hope you'll be able to join us and help show everyone living with IBD that they are not alone. Also a gentle reminder that the IBD Scholarship Program is accepting applications now. This year, we're awarding $5,000 scholarships to 15 inspiring students attending a Canadian post-secondary institution for the upcoming fall semester. Please visit our website at cronesandcolitis.ca to find out more about programs that are available to you. And as always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website as well. With that, a huge thanks also to our task force who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. And thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Abdu Sharkawi and Dr. Ellen Kunzig, in what will be another very interesting discussion on vaccines. Thank you also to BG Communications and Mike the Interpreter for providing our live French language interpretation. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators, Dr. Gil Kaplan, Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary, adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist, and past chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council. And Dr. Eric Benchamal, Professor and Pediatric Gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, and the chair of the Scientific Medical Advisory Council as well as a Crohn's and Colitis Canada board director. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, for that kind introduction. Thanks, Laurie. Number 30, wow. I didn't realize it was number 30 this week. Well, it's March 10th. So do you remember where you were two years ago? That was uh, roughly around this time. Uh, on March 11th, the WHO declared a global pandemic. That's actually when we actually initiated the COVID-19 task force and, um, and then made the decision to do webinars and doing webinars throughout the pandemic. So our first one was on March 19th. And I, I don't think two years ago, we would have th thought that we would be here two years later doing our 30th one. No, but I, you know, I think we should focus on positive here is that we're not in the same situation we were two years ago. Absolutely. Things are much, much better than they were. Uh, you know, there's still lots of concern and lots of worry uh, and anxiety out there. And I think, you know, we're here to hopefully help with that a little bit and just sort of guide you as to what happens in this time of apparently opening up and uh, changes to our public health measures. And for, and for the audience, um, this webinar is actually gonna have a very similar format um, to the one that we did um, previously in January. And it's just that things have changed so dramatically since then. Uh, and where we were in the pandemic is so different today than we were back in January. So I, th I do think this, this is a good time to do it again, but with updated data. Um, and with that, Eric, maybe I'll, I'll pause and let you kind of talk about the 
recommendations and things that have changed with CCC since um, we, we last put here together. Yep, that sounds good. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me a second here. Here we go. So that's today. And really the goal of my few slides is really just to discuss updates on the website and updates to our recommendations of the task force and hopefully uh, clarify some questions that have been coming in to us over the course of the first couple of months of the year. Um, so the CCC COVID-19 task force met again on February 1st. And what we discussed was really, again, an update to Omicron. So if you remember, we met in early January and we were sort of uncertain as to what would happen. I think probably nobody expected the spike in cases that we saw. And also gratefully, thankfully, nobody expected that perhaps it's a little bit less severe than Delta was, uh, resulting in certainly a big spike in hospitalizations, but not a huge spike in deaths uh, that we were concerned about. So we went through that wave and things have gotten better since then, thankfully. Um, we also met to discuss the idea of third and fourth vaccine doses, which we'll, we'll clarify in just a second. Antiviral therapies, which have really been uh, made available since January, uh, a little bit earlier than that for some of them, but at least more, uh, more accessible since January. And then again, the idea of masks and other public health measures in the era of Omicron. And then we reviewed Everything that we reviewed at this last webinar, uh, Gil reviewed some of the serology and immunity data from his vaccine cohort uh, for the Stop COVID-19 and IBD research group. And um, you can scan this QR code and that'll take you to the YouTube video for the last webinar where he reviews it in detail. And I suspect he's gonna give us a little bit of an update later on in this webinar as well. So, Reminder about steroids. So I think this has sort of been the underlying um, message in this month, this month's changes to our recommendations, because I think the more and more data that we have available, both from IBD patients and from other chronic diseases, that steroids are bad. They seem to increase the risk of severe COVID-19, both in adults and children with IBD and data from multiple cohorts have now demonstrated this, demonstrated this association between steroids and bad outcomes with COVID-19. They seem to be associated with the lower response to vaccines, as Gil demonstrated in the, in the previous webinar, and they seem to be associated with faster waning immunity. So your antibody titers anyway, seem to drop faster when you've been on steroids. So with all of that in mind, I think that's this has sort of been uh, the message of our task force from the beginning of the pandemic is that certainly age and probably certain comorbidities are major concerns, major risk factors for severe COVID-19. But beyond age, steroids are really the big time risk factor for severe COVID-19 in IBD patients. In addition to moderate to severely active inflammation, malnutrition and requirement for IV nutrition. So remember that this risk profile is available at this website and you can scan the QR code to get there as well. So the new recommendations that were posted on the website on February 8th, uh, there's two groups. Uh, one is vaccine recommendations and one is recommendations regarding antivirals. So the vaccine recommendations on the COVID-19 website, you can get by clicking on vaccines. And the new recommendations are firstly that all IBD patients five and up should receive a series of three doses of mRNA vaccines uh, if they have IBD, and that's both because of uh, waning immunity, because of Omicron. We know that three doses uh, really work much better than two doses at preventing hospitalizations and severe outcomes, and because of a likelihood that a lot of these patients, especially children, will end up being immunosuppressed in the future, and therefore they need to get their vaccine course when they're not immunosuppressed if possible. Immunocompromised patients, IBD patients, those with moderate to severely active inflammation, and those with moderate to severe malnutrition or who are, are on IV nutrition, parental nutrition, should receive a fourth dose of the vaccine three to six months after the third dose in an order to provide better protection. And really the data supporting that are weak right now and they remain weak, um, but you know, we're sort of balancing the risks and the benefits of a fourth dose of the vaccine. There is really very little downside but do speak to your physician if you had any sort of reaction to a previous dose of the vaccine and you're not sure about whether or not you should get a fourth dose. And then if you were on steroids at any time of any one of the vaccines, 
then you should receive a fourth dose three months after the third dose. And then again, that's, that's really based on some of Gill's data on serology and other, other cohorts that are showing that steroids are a risk factor for waning immunity very quickly. Uh, as well, if you're currently on steroids, you should receive your fourth dose of vaccine one to three months after your third dose in order to ensure that you're protected. Uh, information on this stuff is available at these two QR codes. The top one is for vaccine recommendations. The bottom one is a patient handout that gives you sort of a frequently asked questions and also refers you to the online uh, recommendations as well. So with that, just an update as to how are vaccines working. And the bottom line here is really, really well, very well. Uh, these are data from the Ontario Science Table. And it looks at in the blue line, vaccine effectiveness at preventing any infection uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And you can see we're not as good as we were in the era of Delta. We're really down now at about 50% protection. It's not horrible. It still means that there is protection to two vaccines from getting Omicron because all of Ontario now it's Omicron. Um, and three vaccines, we anticipate this actually to be quite a bit higher, uh, but they don't post those data. So anyway, in the meantime, two vaccines seem not bad. Three vaccines are likely better. Uh, but protection against hospitalization and ICU admission, you can see very excellent protection, even with Omicron, even with two doses. Still recommend the third dose to optimize things. About 50% of these patients got three doses, but we do uh, think that even two doses protects you against hospitalization and ICU admission. And this is looking at those data in, in a different way. This is the rate per capita of vaccinated versus unvaccinated for infection with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you can see that there is still some protection if you're vaccinated, but not a huge amount after two doses. But when you look at hospitalization, there's a bigger protection. And when you look at ICU admission, there's a much bigger protection and very few uh, ICU admitted patients have had two vaccines, very, very few. So really it's the severe outcomes that the vaccines are preventing very well. So let's move on now to the recommendations about antiviral therapies. And just as a definition for what that means, that means a medication you use once you're already infection, infected with SARS-CoV-2 to reduce the length of symptoms and reduce and or reduce the risk of severity uh, of COVID-19. And there's two main types of antiviral therapies available in Canada now, both Health Canada approved. One is called monoclonal antibodies, which is an IV infusion that you get. And one is an oral antiviral treatment. And the, the trade name for that is Paxlovid. Both of them have been approved. Paxlovid was what was approved in January. So new section on the website on antiviral therapies, you can see here next to below the vaccine section. Um, and the recommendations that we give are that we support the availability of antiviral treatments for adult patients with IBD who are immunosuppressed. And that really is the group that is most at risk for severe outcomes. But we strongly recommend uh, antiviral therapy for people who are on steroids, because again, that's the one medication that we have been shown over and over to be associated with severe COVID. And so being on systemic steroids means being on a prednisone equivalent of 20 milligrams per day or more than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day if you're a child. And although Paxlovid is really only indicated, is only approved for use in adults, they, it is sometimes available for children with an infectious disease specialist consultation. So if a doctor sees a child who's potentially on high dose steroids or very sick for reasons of severe inflammation, malnutrition, or other comorbidities, uh, they may consult an ID doctor and the ID doctor may say yes to giving Paxlovid even in a child. Uh, there are now trials ongoing for Paxlovid in children. There are pediatric trials ongoing. So we'll see what happens with those. Um, we also strongly recommend antiviral therapies for anybody who's unvaccinated uh, and for those who got the vaccine more than six months ago, because obviously this, this concern about waning immunity over time, though, those two people, those two groups of people are really the risk, uh, high risk of severe COVID if they catch it. But you really need to discuss the risks and benefits of these treatment with your physician when you see them. Uh, other risk factors may play a role. So if you're obese, if you have other comorbidities like heart disease, lung disease, uh, older age, those are all risk factors that will go into question when uh, people consider whether or not you should get Paxlovid or, uh, or monoclonal antibodies. Obviously, you know, a lot of the provinces require a PCR test uh, to prove that you've gotten SARS-CoV-2 in order to get this um, 
these treatments. So we just wanted to emphasize that in most places, PCR tests are available uh, to people who are immunosuppressed. So if you're on an immunosuppressive medication, you can go and get a PCR test, even if the rest of the world cannot. Uh, in addition, if you go to an emergency room, for example, with COVID, they will do a PCR test there. But in the end, again, strong sort of recommendation for vaccines that, you know, it's better to prevent it in the first place uh, than it is to get treated afterwards. We know that vaccines are still our most effective way of preventing severe COVID-19. So those are the current recommendations and um, we will certainly answer questions about those if you have them. We have some questions that were sent in beforehand, but I wanted to kind of first throw it back to Gil um, and ask Gil about his thoughts. Uh, actually, we're gonna do a, a poll first, right? Sorry, my apologies. I should be following the script. Um, so poll the audience of how many doses of COVID-19 vaccine have you received so far? And I can't see how many people have answered. So I'll leave it to Sarah to decide when, the, when enough and, and to close the poll. And of course, Eric, we have a special population, a special audience who, oh, look at that. 70% um, have had three, um, but it's interesting the other, um, I imagine four. Yeah. I would expect yeah, so that's probably what four. it is. Wow. We probably should have had four in there. So that's quite excellent, right? So that's uh, 86, 96% of our patients yeah, have gotten three or presumably four vaccines. But well, we have that's, a special audience. Because yeah, we do. Maybe I shouldn't be, shouldn't be worried so much about hawking vaccines anymore, right? If so many people <laughs> have gotten it, that's excellent. Well, we're very happy about that. Yeah, yeah. no, no. Because... In, yeah, I was going to say you're not necessarily reflective of the general population. About 50% of Canadians, I think we're at, is have gotten the third dose. So thank you for taking our advice. But almost, uh, I, I don't need to answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> I think the question is everyone has, but you're going to see later on um, uh, a brilliant scientist, Alan Coons, is going to come by and actually compare the results that you see today in this poll with this audience. Again, this is an audience who is engaged, they're listening to you know, us talk about vaccines and things like that. Um, but she's gonna talk a little bit about what the impact is in the general population. And as Eric just mentioned, it's not gonna be um, as high as we're seeing in, in our audience. And, and that's why I, I do want to share with you some of the data that we have on the three dose um, vaccine. Let me just share my screen here. Um, this is people are going to um, who are part of the January webinar are going to see that this is very similar, um, slightly updated a, a bit, but very similar to what I presented before. But I think it's just really important just to highlight the rationale for why we were um, encouraging people to get three doses of the vaccine and, and how important it is relative to all the data and recommendations that that Eric has just shown. And so let me just flip to the next one. So. What happens to antibody levels after three doses of the vaccine in those with IBD? So today I'm gonna to share with you data that was generated by my team at the University of Calgary. Um, we've recruited over 500 people with IBD uh, and we've been measuring their antibody levels to the spike protein after each dose of their vaccine. And we're trying to understand the rise in antibody levels after each vaccine and whether they decay over time and looking at the factors that might influence antibody levels um, such as their age and, and treatments um, that people are on. So this figure shows antibody levels across four vaccine dose categories. Um, so the first dose of the vaccine, so these antibody levels after your first dose. This is after your second dose, but measured within one to eight weeks of the second dose. This group is after your second dose, but measured after eight weeks from your second dose. Um, and this is a group that we measure antibody levels after the third dose of the vaccine. And we don't, have, we, do, we don't have data yet that we can present on the fourth dose, although we are, we are collecting that right now. Uh, this blue line uh, represents the threshold where antibody levels are considered positive. Uh, that's a, a value of around 50. Uh, and you can see on the y-axis that antibody levels vary you know, widely from 10 all the way up to 100,000. Um, and so we fitted the y-axis um, to account for this variability. Um, so overall, 82% of people with, with IBD seroconvert above that threshold value of 50 after their first dose of the vaccine. 
um, and that means that they mount an antibody response. Um, and their average antibody levels after the first dose is about 1,800 units. Now compare that to the second dose. Um, so within one to eight weeks of the second dose of the vaccines, virtually 99% of IBD patients um, seroconvert, mount that antibody response. And you can see that the average antibody levels climb all the way up to 9,200. Um, but with time, as we start to measure people kind of after two months of their, of their vaccine, we do start to see that antibody levels um, decline. Some people actually become seronegative, meaning that they, they no longer have are above that threshold. Um, and you can see the average antibody levels fall to about 3,000. However, if you get that third dose of the vaccine, um, it rescues those fall falling antibodies. Um, after that third dose, 99.5%, is just all but one person that we, that we tested seroconverted. Uh, and those average antibody levels climbed dramatically from an average of around 3,000 to over 14,000 units um, after the third dose. So what happens to antibody levels after the third dose of the vaccine over time? We've actually accumulated more data since we presented this January. So this is a little bit more of an enriched slide that I showed last time. Um, and this figure shows antibody levels again on the y-axis, but this time the x-axis is the days from the third dose of vaccine to when we're measuring those antibody levels. Um, black dots are, dots are those who um, had a previous, um, have never had um, exposure to COVID before, and blue dots are people who were diagnosed with COVID before their vaccine. So after controlling for factors such as age and IBD medications, we are observing that antibody levels do decay by about 12% per week. Um, however, they're dropping from a much, much higher level than compared to where they were with their second dose. Um, and while we don't fully understand what level of antibodies are necessary for full protection, um, we know from other studies that as antibodies fall, breakthrough infection risk does, does increase. Um, now, again, this spring, we're retesting everyone to see exactly what's happening with antibody levels if we follow people's um, uh, antibody levels further out into, into time. Now, we realize that there are a number of factors that can influence antibody levels over time. Um, I just want to discuss for a moment age. Um, in the prior graph, I showed you a two-dimensional image um, where antibody level and time were the, the two points. And now we've created a three-dimensional um, image, which also includes um, age on the z-axis. Um, and so these dots represent antibody levels in someone over the age of 80 who has IBD. Um, and the animation shows us that antibody levels rise consistently across younger age groups. Uh, these are dots for people who were aged between 70 and 79. But as you can see, age isn't the only factor that influences antibody levels because some people who are younger also have lower antibody levels. Um, so one of the big things that we're looking at as an as additional factor is um, um, the, the exposure of drugs, drugs that you're on at the time that you got that third dose of the vaccine. Um, and this shows, this figure shows what happens to these average antibody levels um, as we go across different doses of the vaccine. Um, and we can see across most drug classes, there's a large jump in antibody levels from first dose to second dose, but those antibody levels start to decline, but then are rescued again um, after the, the, the third dose. And what's really important is you can see here that the blue line represents people who are on Stelera Ustekinumab. Um, the yellow is for people who are on Intivir or Vitaluzumab. Uh, these orange is people who were on one of the anti-TNFs, Infliximab, Adalumab, Remicade, Humira, or, or any of their biosimilars. And you can see this giant jump, regardless of what medication you are. In fact, the only one, only drug class that we see a, a low antibody response is the group on, on prednisone. And, and again, that highlights all the information that, that Eric was, was mentioning. So if you were on prednisone at the time that you got your vaccine dose, you didn't mount a very strong antibody response um, thereafter. It still was elevated. It's just lower than as compared to if you weren't on any therapies or if you're on a drug like, like Intivir or Remicade or Humira. So what does this mean about the fourth dose? And I think Eric kind of stressed um, the fact that um, there is not a lot of data out there. We're just, just starting to collect antibody levels post fourth dose. Um, and so ultimately this question is largely unknown and we're trying to answer with, with our best kind of estimates of what we think is the right thing to do without clear data to guide us. Um, and it just highlights the limitation of, of the antibody tests that I've shown uh, so far. Um, we, we just don't know how fast antibody levels are decay. We don't know exactly what antibody level you need to define protection. Even if your antibody levels decay, we know that there are other things aside from antibodies like T cells 
um, and, the, and memory cells uh, that could be part of the, the fight as well. And we don't know exactly how they're um, playing out after third and definitely after, after fourth dose. We also don't know what new variants like Omicron or future new variants might mean to this data and things like that. So we, that's why we still need to do a lot more research um, before we know definitively uh, um, what we could do with fourth dose. But I think right now we're at a good point to say that at least for third dose, uh, it's important for everyone to get their third dose of their vaccine. So uh, lastly, I just want to thank every, all my staff and students, particularly Josh Kwan, who is uh, defending his master's thesis with the data that I, sh I just showed you. Um, he's going to be defending in, in May, and he's done a brilliant job analyzing the, the data. So maybe I'll bring Eric um, back onto the, the question. I know um, everything that we did in our study, our, our study was basically only recruited adults, so anyone over the age of 18. And I just wanted to kind of ask you your perspective on um, what would be the impact of getting a third dose on kids? What's, what data do we know, um, kind of getting a bit of the background of the recommendation you made earlier? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that the um, teenagers, we can talk about teenagers separate from the five to uh, 12 year old, five to 11 year old group. I think the teenagers 12 and up really probably should be following the same recommendations as the adults. I think that's the bottom line is we're seeing similar risk of infection, similar risk of breakthrough infection with Omicron. And so for sure, three doses. Um, I have not yet started necessarily recommending a fourth dose to the teens. Now they may, they probably don't, in Ontario, teenagers were just allowed to get their third dose probably in November if they were immunosuppressed and only last month if they were not immunosuppressed. So we're just coming to the six month mark, I think, uh, in terms of uh, be qualifying for the fourth dose. And I think we're starting to say that, you know, if you're six months out, you should get the fourth dose of, uh, of the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think it's safe and effective and should go ahead and do that if you're immunosuppressed. So in general, teenagers follow the same recommendations as the adults. Uh, children, a little bit different because um, NACI had recommended eight weeks between the first and the second dose, which, you know, I think number one may actually have helped with some of this immune response. Uh, because spacing it out, we know, ends up with a better immune response. However, uh, a lot of people, including myself and, and my daughter, we didn't wait the eight weeks because Omicron was hitting and we felt it was better to get her to the second dose as soon as possible. But I think it is reasonable to wait eight weeks for the third dose, you know, and really that age group does not qualify yet for the third dose, even if immunosuppressed. So for now, for sure, two doses. Is it, should it be eight weeks apart? I think it really depends on your personal circumstance. I think it depends on where you live and how high the prevalence of uh, COVID is in your region, which can be very hard to tell admittedly because we're not doing PCRs in a lot of places anymore. I think number two, the other consideration that I would have is if your child is immunosuppressed and going into a school that has just dropped mask mandates, which I'm sure we'll deal with in a little bit, uh, I would, favor getting that second dose as soon as possible and starting to look at the third dose. Hopefully that will be available soon. Um, so again, I think it really depends on where you live and what your circumstances are. And if I can make a comment on, on timing, um, again, in our study was in adults, not in children, but um, there were some adults that um, got their dose within like four to six years, like right around the recommendation. And those are usually people who were like healthcare workers or in long-term care placement where they were prioritized early. But if you remember in Alberta, um, to try to get more people getting their first dose um, by the spring of 2021, a lot of people were actually pushed so that their doses were delayed to get between their first and their second dose, allowing more people to get their first dose. Um, and so we actually had a, a, a nice split between those delays. And it was interesting, those who had that delay had a, had a marginally higher antibody level after their second dose. So it suggested that maybe that actually was um, providing a bit of extra antibody protection. But interestingly, after their third dose, the antibody levels were so high that it blunted any effect. It really didn't matter whether you had gotten your first and second dose within a month or within three months, by getting that third dose, um, antibody levels were really high and it blunted effects. So I, do, I think that I probably, I suspect the same can be extrapolated for kids, which is the key thing is, is, is getting that third dose when, when possible. Yeah, agreed. All right, so let's move forward now and let me introduce Dr. Ellen Kunzig. Uh, so Gil and I have worked with Ellen for a very long time. Uh, Ellen did her master's degree at Western 
in epidemiology. And then since then her PhD at University of Calgary with Gill in his lab working on IBD. And then her postdoctoral fellowship at CHEO in Ottawa with me working on IBD. And now she's a senior research associate at the SickKids Research Institute, still working on the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, both in adults and in children. Uh, she is an extremely talented epidemiologist who brings scientific knowledge that I don't have myself, busy taking care of patients, but uh, she's phenomenal. And she's recently done a study on the uptake of vaccines uh, in Ontario using data from ICES. And uh, that was recently published in the Lancet Gastroenterology Hepatology. So I'm hoping, Ellen, you can talk to us about what is the true real world uptake of the vaccines second, third dose in, uh, in Ontario right now? Thanks, Eric, for that introduction. And thanks, Eric and Gil, for the invitation to share some data. I'm just going to share my screen. So we wanted to look at whether or not patients were vaccinated and how this compared to people without IBD. Um, so as Eric said, we published the study recently in the Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and these data are about two months old now, so up until January 9th. Uh, so we used, um, we often use health administrative data to study diseases like IBD at a population level. And these data include information that is gathered as part of the administration of our healthcare system and includes things like physician billing, emergency department visits, and physician claims and hospitalizations. And using these data, we're able to identify everyone in Ontario who's living with IBD. And we use these data to uh, create the Ontario Crohn's and Colitis cohort. So this is everyone in Ontario uh, living with IBD. So a little bit different group of people than on the webinar tonight. And these data, are linked to a database called COVAX, which has information on all of the vaccines that have been administered in Ontario and any vaccines administered to someone in Ontario, but outside of, uh, if they had gotten a, a vaccine outside of the province, then they could report it and that vaccine would be counted as well. Um, so our data show that people with IBD are more likely to be vaccinated than the general population. So if on this blue line, these are the first doses. The green line is the second and the red line is uh, the third doses. And the darker color, so the dark blue is IBD uh, first doses, the dark green is um, second doses in IBD patients. And you can see first and second doses are much, much higher um, than in the general population. And uh, so uh, when we compared the two doses in people with IBD, it's 89%. And that compared to people without IBD, it's 84%. So not that different than the webinar uh, participants. But when we look at third doses, only 58% of people with IBD have had a third dose compared to 44% of people without IBD. And these are 32% um, higher in the IBD patients than in people without IBD. And what was really interesting was when we drilled it down a little bit and looked at vaccination rates by age. So this plot here is 18 to 39 year olds and 82% of IBD patients in this age group had two doses compared to 79% in people without IBD. And in three doses, it was 41% uh, of IBD patients had a third dose compared to 28% of uh, people without IBD. And when we compared these two numbers, IBD patients were 47% more likely to have had a third dose. We see a little bit of a different story when we look at the other spectrum, other end of the age spectrum in patients who are 80 years old or older. 94% uh, of IBD patients in this age group had had two doses compared to 89% without IBD. And when we look at three doses, 77% uh, with IBD had uh, three doses and 71% without IBD. So the numbers are much closer in uh, non-IBD patients compared to the general population in this older age group. And there's also um, a, a big age difference. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have had a vaccine. 
And that's just a quick snapshot of the data. And I'll turn it back over to our moderators. Yeah, that was excellent, Ellen, and uh, amazing work. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and it does show us that our, our audience is special. Um, that, but then that then kind of pushes back onto us to kind of figure out how can we actually increase the uptake of vaccines, not not just like um, you know fourth dose, but even just getting people to get their their three doses. Um, I think that's going to be a big push for us to try to increase those numbers over time. Absolutely, and I think we'll see it over time whether that improves. I suspect it will for for our IBD patients going beyond January, but uh, especially judging by our webinar audience. All right, so with that, we're going to start answering some of your questions, and I want to bring in our guests. Um, so unfortunately, Dr. Nesbitt, who was, uh, sorry, Dr. Barrett, who was um, scheduled to be here, uh, called into a province, a provincial policy meeting and couldn't get out of it. So she is not able to attend, but we do have Dr. Abdu Sharkawi, who joined us last month as well, and who is a member of our uh, CCC COVID-19 task force. Dr. Sharkawi is an internal medicine and infectious disease specialist at UHN, University Health Network in Toronto, and an assistant professor of medicine at University of Toronto. Uh, he's a frequent, uh, long-standing member of the Guidelines Committee for the Association of Medical and Microbiology and Infectious Diseases of Canada, uh, with almost 20 years of experience on the front lines dated, dating back to the first SARS virus, the SARS pandemic of 2003. He's been a leading voice and an excellent translator of scientific knowledge to the public over the course of the past two years. So we're super proud to have him on the webinar and to have him as part of our task force. Uh, unfortunately, he's a Leafs fan, and you can tell that from his Twitter feed, but we won't hold it against him. Um, uh, luckily for him, he saves his cheers for his wife and three young boys for the most part. Uh, so welcome, Abdu. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much uh, for having me, Eric. And uh, if it means anything, I'm, I'm a Canadian hockey fan more, more than anything else. So uh, whichever Canadian team makes it into the playoffs, so I'll, I'll cheer you for said a, you, you said a Canadian hockey fan, right? You said a Canadian I'm a hockey Canadian fan. hockey fan. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> you're a fan of the Toronto Blue Jays. You actually can see them play now. It's uh, yeah. today. Yeah. So. <laughs> Let's hope we can talk more about uh, sports and, and striking out uh, – uh, things other than viruses pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well welcome. Well, and and Abby, I was just going to ask you the kind of the first question. We had, we had a lot of questions around fourth dose. And, and I think like if, if you saw the, the data that we presented, and we're actually starting to see some international data on third dose come out as well, very similar to what we're seeing in Calgary. I think that's pretty established that this is at minimum a three dose vaccine schedule. You need three doses. What are your thoughts on, on the fourth dose considering just, you know, there's much less data on it, um, but we're, we are seeing um, guidance through um, provinces around people who are immunocompromised getting that fourth dose. So just trying to think of what you think about it and, and if those who are getting it, um, timing of it and things like that. These are a lot of the questions that are being asked by our audience. Yeah, I think the challenge right now in terms of determining the suitability of a fourth dose is, is simply uh, not having enough time having accrued really since Omicron became uh, a big deal and has subsided in many parts of the world, unfortunately, in many parts of Canada. Um, but we probably have to counterbalance that with the potential for another wave and for a spike in infections related to, in particular, this BA2 sublineage that we keep hearing about that is lurking in the background. And some people seem to be, I think, not so worried about it. Others, including myself, are kind of keeping a very close eye on it for a few reasons. One is that it has a lot of the same characteristics as its uh, cousin, BA1, that was the dominant form of Omicron around the world. Uh, in terms of how transmissible it is, it's very contagious. It spreads easily from one person to the next. But what may be a bit more intriguing and potentially more troubling is the fact that in terms of its immune evasiveness, when you look at the types of mutations, its fingerprint is a little bit more nasty, believe it or not, than BA1. Now, what does that mean in terms of immunity to people who are already vaccinated against Omicron from before? Um, probably reasonable protection. We think that if you've been immunized, and were reasonably well protected against the first iteration of Omicron, and you maintain that immunity uh, 
you're going to be probably okay against BA2. However, if you're not sufficiently immunized in terms of having immunity against Omicron, and let's say for whatever reason, you only have immunity that was acquired during the Delta phase, and hopefully that's the minority of patients, especially those with IBD, uh, you may be in trouble because the, the, uh, it does not confer the same sort of cross immunity, if you will, uh, from Delta, for example, to Omicron 1 or Omicron 2. So frankly, I think what we're going to be seeing is a, a risk-based approach. Uh, we're going to be uh, probably advocating for fourth doses in um, jurisdictions where we're seeing uh, an increase in transmission. And even if that is a spike that's starting to go up, but hasn't led to a huge number of, of uh, cases within hospitals, I think it would be very reasonable to consider uh, a fourth dose and probably within a three month time frame, simply because it's very unpredictable as to what may happen with this sublineage uh, for people who are at, at greatest risk. I would keep a very, very close eye on that. Can you speak, Abdu, about because the evidence about the fourth dose and effectiveness? I think I saw some data from Israel showing kind of underwhelming effectiveness at preventing infection for the fourth dose. Is there any new data that I haven't seen? There, there really isn't, unfortunately, but I think part of the problem may be just an undersampling and tr truthfully, a lack of time. Remember, the whole reason we're giving additional doses is our concern about waning immunity. So the question is, if we've accrued enough immunity through three doses, even with IBD, for example, and having been on biologics or something else, when are we going to see that waning occur? Um, I, I think there's a very strong likelihood that, of course, we will see it. Perhaps we just haven't seen it yet. And then I think we have to really balance the odds of transmission occurring in a very high rate in a particular community and the age of, of the, the individual, the circumstances that they're in, and then determine if they are going to be skewed towards a higher likelihood of that immunity starting to wane. When is that going to happen? I don't think anybody has the answer to that. I think, I think we'll probably know by the summer. Certainly we'll have a very good idea by then um, from, from antibody uh, levels and, and studies that are done uh, in Israel. I know some studies are going on there and I think in South Africa as well. And we'll have a better idea at that point and hopefully um, not with you know, a sub or mini wave happening to challenge us even further at the time. And a point that you mentioned that I, I just want to stress with the audience, because it's one that we met, we made in the last webinar, is that this may vary depending on where you're living and how big of a risk the, and a, the uh, COVID is at, at your place in time. So if you're living in a, in a place where it's a highly populated city and we're now starting to see an outbreak, um, you know, that is going to be a little bit different than if you're living in regions where we're seeing um, cases less. And, and with that in mind, um, I just kind of want to ask you, like, I know people are not testing as much anymore. So how do you, how do you, what's the best way for us to know that things are breaking out? Like I know as a gastroenterologist, one of the things that's very appealing is people are actually um, starting to test wastewater and things like that to kind of get a sense. But I'm just like, how, how are we going to know um, when outbreaks are happening to know how we need to be kind of retreating a bit. Yeah, this is a big challenge. And of course, you know, it has a lot of uh, political implications. There's a lot of policy implications in terms of how to maintain an infrastructure of risk assessment um, when uh, there's a real, I think, focus on hospitalizations and ICU admissions and deaths as the main metrics. And while we certainly don't want to dismiss those as being the most important, I think it's critical to remember that they are not the only important metrics to follow. Uh, and so you're very accurate in, in, in identifying uh, the, the sort of vast void we are left with now if we don't have PCR uh, testing available widely and Rapid antigen testing, unfortunately, is very inconsistently available depending on your means and your ability to procure them. In addition, you have to know when and how to use them. And you have to use them frequently, quite frankly, to get the highest yield from uh, them. And that means knowing 
when you might be exposed to someone, using it repeatedly, if you think you've been exposed and you're symptomatic, and then knowing to follow up if the test is negative and you're still worried that your symptoms are compatible with COVID-19. There's a lot that goes into that that's obviously much more difficult than just going to a COVID testing clinic and saying, give me a PCR test. Um, you mentioned the wastewater testing, which is really a fascinating tool because it does seem to fairly accurately forecast and depict what's going on in the community um, with, with fairly good reliability. The, the problem is it's not, number one, adequately available everywhere. Uh, so you may have jurisdictions that, that don't have reliable wastewater uh, testing at all, and you're kind of left not really sure what's going on. You, you're going to have to really keep your, your eye on the ball in terms of if you're seeing outbreaks occurring in places like schools or in workplaces, etc. That's a signal that things are probably not going so well. What I would say is, you know, be, be cautious. You know, my approach at this point is with the lack of knowledge, the best thing to do is to protect yourself and, and err on the side of caution. And that means you know, whether there's mandates or not, I would recommend still wearing masks in indoor places in public. I would recommend that those masks be good masks, can 95 or N95 grade masks. I would be very careful about indoor meetings with non-household contacts. I would be careful about really any exposure if uh, I'm not very confident about who I'm meeting with um, and, and what my level of immunity is at, at, any, at any given point in time. Um, and it's, it's disappointing to see that we may have to roll back and reintroduce certain measures if we see a spike in transmission. Um, but I think we can protect ourselves and we can protect our patients uh, by being wise and being commonsensical about uh, not taking chances, uh, especially if things are starting to turn the other way. So let's see how people are feeling. So I, I'm sure people heard uh, yesterday Twitter explode. Um, uh, certainly in Ontario, we have announced a plan to lift all mandates. Alberta has already done that. Multiple provinces have already done that. So we're hoping to hear from the audience here to find out how you feel about public health measures being rolled back, including the vaccine mandates, the passports, the mandatory masks indoors, and so on. So you could vote now. And we'll talk a little bit more about, more about what that means in just a second. Well, people are doing the poll. Um, tonight's actually um, the first time in two years I'm actually going to go into one of my child um, elementary schools. My, my young daughter has a kind of a, a parent teacher show the classroom thing. And it's first time in two years that I'll have actually walked into an elementary school. Um, and, um, and of course, my family, we're, we're going to all wear masks. Um, but I'm curious to see how many people around us are. So I know how I would be answering this poll question. Yeah, so people are pretty apprehensive about this. Obviously, you know, with this audience, uh, many of whom are immunosuppressed, this really isn't a surprise. And we certainly understand your apprehension. And we can talk about maybe a few situations that could happen going forward, I think. I think, um, Abdu, you sort of really reinforce that you got to protect yourself at this stage, right? That really, if you're immunosuppressed, if you have any risk factors for severe COVID, Masking is absolutely key. I mean, we already know that this audience is very heavily vaccinated, which is priority one. But beyond that, the importance of N95 and KN95 masks, we touched on this last month, but do you want to speak to the role of cloth or surgical masks in the era, era of Omicron? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, truthfully, we didn't even need to wait for Omicron, but I think Omicron really made it very abundantly clear that we had to focus on every risk mitigation strategy uh, at our disposal. And masking is obviously one of the easiest in terms of uh, getting people to readily appreciate how to do it and do it for themselves. Uh, truthfully, cloth masks and uh, surgical masks were probably not very appropriate at all at any point in the pandemic. Uh, but again, Omicron spread rapidly from one person to the next. Uh, we started to see people you know, uh, flooding the hospitals. And, and I think there was a level of awareness that rose. The, the intrinsic characteristics of the virus itself have not changed. Um, I think there's pretty good evidence that the better the barrier, 
the, decre the, the, the lower the risk of, of transmitting, number one, and to a lesser extent, but also proportionally important extent, the less the risk is of acquiring uh, the, the infection from somebody else. And so N95, KN95 are, are fantastic. If they are used appropriately, which means you've got a good seal around the bridge of your nose and under your chin, and if you put on a pair of glasses, they're not fogging up. If you can't feel air above and below when you're taking a good breath in and out, then that's probably a good seal for you. Um, those are really what you should be using. Uh, if you can't get them, and I understand they're, they're not readily abundant, and sometimes it's impossible to get them if you don't know of someone who has means, by all means, you know, a, a three-ply mask is probably decent, uh, but it's not quite as good. Uh, and you can be creative, really. I've had people make ba uh, uh, masks out of vacuum bags um, that has an excellent filtration quality to it. I think the key is to remember that the fit, the fit and how snug a mask is, is absolutely critical because I can have a fantastic N95 mask, but if I don't have it on properly and there's air leaking from above or below, then it's just as good as probably not wearing much of anything. Uh, but if you've got a good three-ply mask, for example, or a, a double mask and it fits really nicely and tightly, um, you know, covering the bridge of your nose, underneath your chin, um, that's going to going to help you. And bear in mind, of course, try and still be mindful of the proximity of yourself to others. So don't, you know, uh, sit next to somebody with impunity uh, in an intimate setting for a very long time if you don't have to indoors. Uh, try and do whatever you can to sort of minimize the, the additive risk that you would undertake, even if you're wearing a mask. I think that's really important to still uh, be mindful of, especially if you're immune compromised. And the other <laughs> things that we've talked about before is encouraging other people to get their third vaccine to prevent that infection risk. And, you know, the use of rapid antigen testing, which I think is becoming more available you know, it's controversy, controversial. It, they're, they're not perfect tests by any means, but, you know, I think they have their role in if you're attending a gathering, you know, having everybody do that is better than not knowing at all. And oh, Abdu, absolutely. Absolutely. the idea of swabbing the throat before the nose. Yeah. So this is interesting because we started to see a lot more in the way of pharyngitis, sore throat symptoms that became a little bit more um, salient as a feature with Omicron compared to Delta and, and Alpha and the other variants from before. Um, I don't know, we don't have any hard data, frankly, to say that uh, swapping the throat on top of or in lieu of the, the, the nose is any more reliable. Um, if you want to know my opinion, I do both. Um, you know, when my kids were having, you know, quasi symptoms last week, I, I did both. Um, and I think it's sort of intuitive that uh, you're probably going to get a higher yield and you're more likely to cover your bases if you're swapping both areas. You're not testing for microorganisms, so there's no issue about cross-contaminating one from the other. If it's present in one or the other, um, go ahead and do it if you can tolerate it. So um, I, I think it's reasonable to do both. Uh, in terms of the timing, we recommend uh, definitely at least the day of, if you're going to be doing a, a, an event with, with others, at least a few hours before, two or three hours before, I generally recommend, in fact, that people do it the day before as well. And if you've got two negative tests in succession and you're really feeling fine, obviously it doesn't rule out, but it really reduces the likelihood that you have enough uh, inside you to transmit. So that's really the key thing, is you don't want to set up these situations so that they're super spreader events where nobody's testing and potentially nobody's aware and then a whole bunch of people go home positive at some point over the next week. So that's what we recommend. And in terms of, of symptoms, they're really high yield re right up until five to seven days. And if it's negative on five days post symptoms, we usually recommend another test uh, 48 hours later, obviously isolating in between. And get a PCR test if you're concerned and speak to, you, to your doctor and your health uh, provider, because at that point, you certainly don't want to be in a situation where you're getting worse um, and may need treatment, uh, whether that's antiviral therapy or something else in, in a monitored setting. 
think I would add in just one of the questions we had was like, what do you do if you, if you, you do test um, positive for COVID nowadays? And a lot of time that's going to be with a home antigen test. And, and I think um, it's key to get that PCR test so that you could potentially be eligible for um, an antiviral or antibody treatment as, as Eric described in his recommendations. Typically you want to be able to um, get those treatments within five days of being uh, diagnosed with, with COVID. Um, it's going to be a little bit different from province to province in Alberta. Um, HealthLink 811 um, or, or reaching out to AHS um, online. Um, there's protocols in place um, where you can uh, explain that you're immunocompromised and you fit, will fit within a criteria box. And then if you fit within that criteria, you can then turn around and um, they'll connect you with um, a healthcare provider that can then um, organize, for example, the, the antiviral medications. And then of course, it's really important to let your gastroenterologist know that, that this is happening too, because then they can give you guidance on what to do with your medications. And it'll be different for different medications. If, for example, if you're on mesalamine or 5-ASA, they'll say, you know, continue it. Um, if you're um, on a biologic, they'll likely say, you know, um, while you're acutely sick with, with COVID, you want to um, hold treatment. But then the question is, is, you know, when that is, if you're on every eight weeks of Intivio, for example, and you get COVID in the middle of it, you might not need to delay, delay anything. If you're on Humira and getting an injection every week, you might end up missing one week. And that's where it's really important to reach out to your um, uh, gastroenterologist and to remember that if you're on um, prednisone, the one thing I would just say about all the comments that are made here is that if you're actively sick, needing prednisone, particularly doses above 20, this is when you really want to take extra care about all the things that um, Eric and Abby have mentioned um, already around masking, around protecting yourself, around reducing your risk of exposure. Um, and, and that's even the time where, you know, some people ask like, when do I take time off work? So if somebody is, you know, actively flaring with inflammatory bowel disease, they're having diarrhea, they're bleeding, I'm giving them high dose of prednisone. I have no issues writing um, a, a letter saying, you know, you need time off work um, because you're, you're actively sick. Even, even if it wasn't a pandemic, but you think more so now where you can then be able to kind of protect yourself until you get down onto the lower dose of prednisone eventually off completely. Yeah, I think the one point that I think it really needs to be reinforced is the timing. Um, you know, the, these, these therapies are really good in terms of preventing serious disease, but they're really most effective when they're started as early as possible. So, you know, the monoclonal antibodies of Atramed you have to get that within seven days of onset of symptoms. That may seem like a long period of time, but believe it or not, there's people that understate their symptoms and they hunker along. And then before you know it, they're really sick and they've waited too long. And then the effect of, of the monoclonal antibody is severely diminished. And for Paxlovid, the oral therapy, it's even shorter. It's within five days. And on top of that, you've got to satisfy the need of, of PCR testing as well. So you know, that's a lot of ducks to get into a row. Uh, so the key point, I think, is don't wait. If you're concerned, speak to somebody, uh, get a sense as to whether this is very likely to be COVID or, or not, and act quickly. And the worst, the, the worst thing that can happen is, you know, it's not COVID and somebody's keeping a closer uh, eye on you. So uh, I would highly recommend just being very finely attuned to your symptoms and not delaying and I have to say, if people are worried about getting the PCR test, it's not as bad as it used to be. I don't know if this is in all places, but certainly the brain tickle that was happening in March 2020, they've learned to do it in a lot of places a little bit less aggressively. Uh, and even in some places, anterior nair, like anterior nostril, so that it's not, uh, not quite way up there. Uh, although some of the medical facilities may still be going fairly high up, I think. I'm still getting frontal biopsies, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so let's ask this question here. So, uh, Abdu, why do breakthrough infections happen after vaccines? Yeah, the simple answer to that is waning immunity. Um, you know, we, we, we see a, a nice rise in, in what we call B cells, uh, the memory cells that are able to uh, maintain that signal uh, of memory and then can deploy uh, the antibodies to attack the virus. Uh, that's going to wane over time um, depending on your age, depending on uh, the level of immunosuppression that you may be on. Um, and we, we know that the, the, the T cell response may persist a little bit longer in, in the background. And sometimes that uh, covers us off a little bit and makes up that shortfall uh, for, for the B cell memory uh, waning, but it's often not good enough, uh, especially when you are of advanced age or 
you're on more immunosuppression. And interestingly, we've seen that the immunity probably does have something to do with the variants as well. So, you know, Omicron really changed things because um, it, it was immune evasive, but by design, by nature, even for people who are immune competent, the, the efficacy was, was not good. And you needed to sort of bolster that immunity with a second dose in order to catch up and maintain that same level of B cell memory response and then the T cell response to stay up with it. Um, that's something that I think we need to be mindful of. Uh, and going forward, we, we have to be um, very much attuned to the, to, to the idea that we shouldn't feel completely comfortable uh, with the last dose that we had if transmission within our community is starting to go up um, and if we're seeing any signals from other parts of the world, for example, places like Israel and the UK uh, and South Africa in particular that have been very fertile grounds for research and often give us some indication as to what's going on. So uh, timing, timing, timing. Timing is everything, uh, really. Uh, and it behooves patients, I think, to really stay on top of knowing uh, what their uh, biologic uh, therapy is and the timing of it in terms of when they might and should receive their next dose so that they can maintain their immunity and not have it wane any longer uh, than it should. Yeah, and that's what your doctor is there for, right? We, we certainly get lots of questions from patients about what should happen and when should we get the next dose and should we get the next dose? So please ask, right? I think most of your physicians, whether it's your family doctor, your primary care provider or your gastroenterologist is there to, uh, to provide advice. And so I think we covered this yeah. question, right? And, and while we're flipping to the next one, Eric, I said in the um, chat box, several people have asked about um, kids at school, just like under the age of five, not vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, moving into a time where kids might not be wearing masks depending on yeah. stuff like that. So kind of what guidance around kids with IBD and mask wearing yeah. for themselves versus the risk in people if they stop wearing masks. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the first questions we got was from a teacher with IBD and, and what should they do? And I think we've answered that. I hope that, that we're talking about masking being a very key protective measure. Um, obviously vaccination, distancing where possible, you know, I think again, less less of an important issue with Omicron, considering how far it can spread. Uh, but masks, good N95 or KN95 masks being key. So, what about children under five? I, I think that the one thing to remember is that most children under five do very well when they get COVID and do not get very sick, um, even if they are unvaccinated. So, I think, like you know, you have to remember the positive that. For the most part, if they get COVID, they will have mild symptoms, they will not end up in hospital. So some reassurance there that most pediatricians would say that it is worth the risk of getting COVID in order to attend school and have that social and developmental and educational uh, benefit of attending school in person. Now, I think there are some exceptions to that, and I think we need to be careful with painting all children with one brush. I think that Children with what we call very early onset IBD, so children under six who get IBD, who have a monogenic or genetic form of the disease, a single gene mutation, often that's associated with an immune system dysfunction. And so those are not the same as older children with IBD. Uh, it's a small group of patients, but I think if your child has very early onset IBD, you should speak to your gastroenterologist about the risks and the benefits of attending school in person, especially around unmasked other children. Um, and then I, again, same thing, sort of medications, right? So steroids, especially stay home, the child should stay home. The other medicines seem to be generally not associated with a risk for severe COVID-19, although we're not always sure. So I think case by case, you really have to speak to your physician to, to get your, their recommendations. And then finally, I think that although other children may not be, um, may not be masked, unfortunately. And, and if mask mandates are dropped, the concern is that many children will not be masked in schools. I think there's two things that you can do. You can encourage your child to continue wearing a mask. And they even have little kitty at KN95 masks. They don't always stay on and they're not always the perfect fit, but it's better than nothing. Um, so that's what I would certainly recommend uh, to my patients to continue to do. And the other thing is, I think that you can advocate for your child at school. 
And I think that many teachers, if knowing that there is a child who is immunosuppressed in their class, uh, I think many teachers and many schools would be very willing to enforce masking in the class. And if you can't, if you're not getting anywhere with them, please ask us, ask your doctor, ask the IBD clinic to help you with advocacy for your child. Because again, most of the time we get very good response to that type of, you know, awareness for the, for the schools. And they're, they're very, they want to protect your children, right? They don't want your children at risk. I don't know, Abdu, do you have any other recommendations? For no, that? I mean, I think those are all very um, reasonable and helpful uh, points uh, of advice, especially the advocacy part. Um, the other thing that I would, you know, uh, offer to, to hopefully provide some level of optimism is depending on exactly the age and what the setup is, hopefully some of this child care and, and attending school can, can happen outdoors, uh, you know, as the spring moves along, that's going to help reduce transmission, um, make the environment safer. I know, for example, you know, I've got a six-year-old and he goes to uh, a, a, a class where a lot of the kids, you know, they're not masked, but I've actually gone there. I've tested the CO2 levels and, um, you know, they've got two HEPA filters, they open windows, you know, there's all these other sort of relatively low tech things that can minimize the risk further. So that can be uh, looked into. And Finally, we, we had hoped that uh, we'd have approval of vaccines for kids under the age of five by now. It's stalled a little bit, but I don't think that's going to stall indefinitely. I'm very hopeful by the, by the summer we'll have worked out the kinks, uh, and probably just in terms of fine-tuning uh, fine the dose that, that we're going to give for, for kids that are under the age of five. There's a bit of a discrepancy in the two to four age compared to the other um, you know, kids that are under the age of two, and I think that'll be ironed out and once that is I'm very hopeful that we'll start immunizing kids under the age of five, too. So not all. I, I want. I think we should abs make perfectly clear to the audience that the kinks do not mean more side effects, uh, right? Like we're talking yes. about the kinks, meaning Dosing. older children. Yeah, older children probably received too low a dose of the vaccine in the trials, and so they did. They were not as immune. It wasn't as protective as it was in younger children, and as we would expect in you know children's over or children over five. So it's safe. We think, you know, we still need to see the data, but uh, the hope is that we'll be able to have a, a safe and effective vaccine soon for children under five. And what I always find interesting is that even before the pandemic, schools make accommodations for kids. Like, for example, if you have a nut allergy, you know, we don't bring nuts into the school and things like that. There are accommodations. So I think, Eric, the point that you made earlier about advocating, and then I think just ex explaining your situation, whether you're the teacher or you have, you're the child or you're the, the parent of the child or in work, um, I think the other important thing is just kindness. Like people should, you know, you can wear a mask to protect yourself even in an, an area where it's not mandated anymore. And I think just explaining to people and just and then just asking those people around you to be kind. That's I think that's the most important thing. We should just be kind and respectful. I, I want to pivot to Ellen because she's turned off her camera and she's hiding. But I think uh, I think I'm allowed to say because she's been on this webinar before in other capacity as a patient with IBD. Uh, and I'm curious from you, Ellen, of how you're feeling about, you know, mandates being lifted and things starting to open up. Um, and we can ask that, that next question that was put up on the, on the screen as well. From your perspective, both as a physician, as a patient rather, and an epidemiologist, how will you know that it's safe to do things? And how will you know when the pandemic is over? And then, Abdul, I'll, I'll pivot that same question to you as well. So like many of you in the audience, I'm feeling a little apprehensive about everything being lifted. Um, first of all, when vaccine mandates were lifted, that felt like a bit a little bit of a blow and then masks is a whole nother ball game. Um, so things that I'm doing to keep myself self safe to self safe. I'm definitely still working from home. Um, I'm starting to plan some smaller gatherings with friends who have also been had at least three doses of the vaccine. Um, outdoors when possible. So doing the things that we've been doing for two years um, to keep ourselves safe, continuing to wear masks. Um, I was living in Ottawa for a while and really enjoyed having the wastewater data there. And that was kind of my go-to even when we were still doing PCR tests. Um, so there's lots of resources that are there if you're able um, to access those, that's great. I've um, 
also been accumulating rapid tests when I go to the grocery store. You can do uh, lots of grocery stores in Ontario have them. Um, so that's another great resource to test friends before you're gathering. Um, so lots of the, it's the same things we've been doing for two years that I'm planning to do, avoiding kind of big crowds. Um, there's a few places in Ontario anyways that are still going to keep the mask mandates, lots of independent movie theaters, um, some of the, the, uh, the National Arts Centre in Ottawa, the Stratford Festival. So I'm going to pick and choose some of those things where I can feel like I'm slowly getting back to normal in a slightly more safer controlled environment. Um, but how will we know when the pandemic is over is a, a question that I'm not sure I know how to answer. I think a key thing for me is all of the surgeries that have been postponed and canceled and just really getting our healthcare system back up and functioning uh, the way it should be. I think it will be a big marker of success against the pandemic, against COVID for me. But I'm curious to see what everyone else thinks. Yeah, Abdu, how will you know when the pandemic is over? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hate to, to, to be pessimistic. And, uh, you know, I, I love your optimism, Ellen, but uh, I think sadly the, the blow to our healthcare system is going to take decades to repair itself uh, from this pandemic. So I'm, I'm not really sure that um, that's going to be an indicator that we've, we've passed through this. I've actually thought about this a lot, and, and I'm, I'm going to give a fairly simple, almost unbelievably simplistic answer, but bear with me. I, I think we'll know that this pandemic is over when we've actually passed through two consecutive seasons, and we haven't had a wave. Because we've gone from March 2020 until now, where that has not been the case. We have dropped through a spring lasted through a summer, but then picked up again in the fall. We've gone through the fall, but then picked up again in the spring by skipping a little bit in the winter, and it goes on and on. And I think that you know, if we can get through a spring and summer season and a fall season it starts to snow and it's cold, and we haven't seen a big spike in people coming into hospitals, then the pandemic is over wherever you happen to be. Am I confident that that is the case? I can't say that right now for two reasons, because the vaccine coverage deficits that we've talked about before, uh, it's great to see how IBD patients are probably pushing that envelope better than the general population, but there's still big gaps in the 18 to 39 age population. Much of that's predicated on just behavioral science and people feeling like they wanna get on with things, a whole host of reasons. Um, I think it's still going to be important to have the cohort that's under the age of five and under the age of 11, more optimally vaccinated right here. And more importantly, on a much more macro level and a global level, it's a global pandemic. We keep talking about that. For some people, it seems like it's a euphemism, but the reality is these, all of these variants are driven out of places that are under-resourced, where there's a selection pressure to push these variants that outcompete the previous strains of this virus and present greater challenges, not just there, but in other parts of the world. And if we don't really pay attention to vaccine equity in places like Haiti, where 0.86% of the population has two vaccines, you know, or Ethiopia and Nigeria, which are at like three and 4%, I think it's foolish to imagine that somehow that's just going to work its way out. And we're not gonna have problems in Edmonton or in New York or in Montreal it's going to get here. So we have to do our due diligence and advocate for true vaccine equity um, and collaboration with, with every part and program uh, in, in industry and, and health domains to make this happen. Or unfortunately, this will drag on. I think that, that two season concept is interesting. I mean, I think it's something that hasn't gotten enough attention really in terms of the cyclical nature of COVID where we seem to see every two to three months a spike and we can maybe flatten that curve for that old term that we used in 2020. We can flatten it a little bit with, with public health measures. Omicron, we were not able to clearly, although we don't know how bad it could have gotten. Why is there this cyclical or seasonal nature to this virus? What's happening there? Well, like most respiratory viruses, 
you know, the conditions that are most conducive to, to spread are people being in close proximity to one another. So it's not surprising that um, you're going to see higher amounts of circulating virus in the winter time where people are congregating indoors uh, for greater periods of time. And then you're going to see it dissipate, um, not just because they're outdoors, but because hopefully you're adding some other public health measures, which include whatever capacity limits there are, you know, restrictions uh, here and there, and, and recognizing that masking and other things um, are doing what they're supposed to do. And by the way, I want to highlight, you know, how many people have had the flu in the last two years? You know, I think we're, we're really underselling the value of masking and proper masking as just a fantastic protective tool. I can't remember two years in my entire career that were this boring and fantastically boring from a flu standpoint than these last two years. And thank God, because if we had that on top of Omicron or Delta, it would have been nightmarish what that could have done to people and to our healthcare system. So, you know, I, I think that it's really important to, to bear in mind that the characteristics of most respiratory viruses are, are based on proximity, poor circulation, um, you know, congestion. Uh, in time and space and the duration of that, um, you know, even influenza did that. There were several waves during the influenza pandemic back in 1918. Uh, obviously, it killed a lot more people because the infrastructure of healthcare was terrible. At that point, there was no antivirals and there was no flu vaccine at that point. Uh, so things have improved, but now we're in a race and we're in a race at trying to outcompete the, the viruses who continue to evolve to become more immune evasive and to become more transmissible. And that puts greater pressure on us to use all of these tools that are at our disposal and to be, I think, extra patient about letting go of these tools and underestimating how long they continue to be made important before we say, ah, we've lit this. And that's the only thing that I worry about. The virus will become much more cyclical and much more able to rear itself uh, to a new wave and to reemerge if I think we give up on either of those two fronts. So we shouldn't do that. Bill, there was a question in the audience about, uh, can co is there any new data on COVID-19 triggering an IBD flare? Have you seen anything about that? People are starting to look into that and we're not seeing like a direct causal link of like the virus triggering a flare of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the virus um, spike protein do bind these ACE, um, receptors. They are found in the small bowel, and that's why up to 10 to 15% of people um, can get GI symptoms if they don't have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and in addition to that, if you, have, if you have IBD, you might notice that your symptoms are a little bit more active, but most people are reporting that that is short-lived and doesn't require necessarily um, an activation of their inflammatory bowel disease that would then require them to be treated, Just to, but also to recognize that this is so important to have a control group because at any given month, there's a risk of any individual flaring, um, whether they were exposed to a virus or, or not. And so when we do some of these control studies, we're, we're not seeing you know, a big like signal to say that it's triggering a flare. On the flip side of that is some people will have to hold their medications. Um, and if you're holding your medications um, and depending on how long it is and at what point in the cycle of your treatment it is, you sometimes can get breakthrough in inflammatory bowel disease as a result of, of holding off on, on the infection. Similarly, people are also looking to see if getting the vaccine um, triggers a flare of inflammatory bowel disease. And again, when we look at kind of control studies, and again, and, and control is important just because at any given month, you, there is a probability of having a flare independent of whether you've got a vaccine, you've got COVID or anything else happening. So relative to that, that baseline risk, we're not seeing like a high risk within you know, 30 days of getting a vaccine that people are, are flaring. On an individual level, an individual might experience certain things, but if you're looking at it at the, at the whole, we're not seeing a major signal. And I would just echo that, you know, I've done similar um, sort of symposia and, and, and working groups with you know, multiple sclerosis, psoriatic arthritis, um, a whole host of other um, patient groups with autoimmune disease, you know, the principle remains fairly static and fairly um, confidently established that the risk of triggering a flare of almost any autoimmune condition is hugely higher with the particular infectious condition you're trying to prevent than it is with a vaccine. 
um, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's the timing that's probably most important so that you don't have the wrong balance of immunomodulation um, that's going to make you either feel unwell or maybe not create the, the, the best balance of antibody production at the right time. But in my line of work, it's, it's always the disease. It's always the disease that's much, much worse, um, the infection that's triggering the flare, not the vaccine. There was another yeah, one, what, one quick question before we get to the friends and family question. Um, there was a question about whether or not you need to be hospitalized to get the antiviral treatments. And I don't know, Abdu? No, you don't. I'm um, certainly not for, for Paxlovid. Paxlovid is, is an oral therapy. It's taken twice a day and it's a really neat compound that's made up of half um, an antiviral itself. And the other half is what's called a protease inhibitor. It literally chews up uh, bits of the viral protein so that it can't become uh, functionally active. Um, you, you, you just need to uh, meet criteria for that. So you've, you've got to get your PCR testing uh, done fairly quickly and uh, you can take that. It's taken for five days and you can take that at home. Uh, the antibodies do need to be done within an infusion clinic. Um, in the GTA, there's, there's a clinic uh, in, in Hamilton, Dr. Zane Chagla, one of her infectious disease colleagues there does a fantastic job running a clinic there. I'm not so sure uh, what the situation might be. I assume there's the same setup in, in, in Calgary and many other parts of Canada. They are limited, um, but they are out there. Uh, I think the key is to, to make sure that you're aware of them and that you can um, make an appointment, make a connection with somebody so that you can be referred to them within the right time frame. And, and so for, for these antibodies, it's within seven days, um, has to be done as an infusion within a uh, supervised medical setting, uh, can't be done at home. So I guess for all of the panelists, how do we encourage friends and family to be vaccinated? I worry about this question, right? Because I don't know how other people feel. If by now your friends and family are not vaccinated, and this goes for our patients as well, right? I mean, we try every time they come in, but if by now they're not vaccinated, I don't know what you can do to get them vaccinated. I don't know, Gil, Abdu, Ellen, what are you doing to help friends and family? Well, I think I think maybe reframing the question is is how do we encourage our friends and family to get their third dose of the vaccine? I, I agree. I think if you're at this point in March of 2022, if you've had zero dose of the vaccine, considering all the mandates, all the restrictions to your life, um, everything that's out there, you're, I don't think there's anything that Gil Kaplan could say to you that's going to, oh, I'll get my vaccine. Um, and then, but but I do think, as Ellen's data showed, that there is a gap between the second and the third third dose of vaccine. And that gap is going to be critical um, in, in encouraging people. And, and maybe the, the one to kind of step back to my comment is, um, I, I suspect there's probably is, um, additional hesitancy with for children. And, and again, I'll bring this back to you, Eric, to answer this question. There may be some kids who haven't gotten their first and second dose vaccine, and, and they may be more um, uh, amenable to it based on just more data and more time. Um, but, but I do think that it's, you know, trying to address that gap between second and third is probably the, the biggest bang of buck that we can get right now. And I, I would argue for children, I don't think we need more data and more time. I think the CDC released some data last week that was very convincing that it prevents hospitalizations and severe outcomes in children with COVID-19, even though it's very rare to have those severe outcomes. So, uh, you know, I think showing them that those data and, and saying, listen, you know, yes, they usually get less severe disease, but there are cases where it's severe. Here's the data. It prevents bad outcomes in kids. So please get your vaccine. And so one I point. think most of my patients have been pretty good about it. Sorry, Eric. What, what, one point that may be of value to some people, I know that uh, there is a cohort of people out there who just have this incredible fear of mRNA vaccines in particular um, for all kinds of different reasons that we know uh, are not necessarily uh, founded in, in, in science, uh, but people's fears are people's fears and they're legitimate and we have to respect them and try and, and address them appropriately. The good news is we have options now. So, you know, there is Novavax and there's, uh, you know, a plant-based uh, vaccine that, that, that's made by Medicago, a, a Canadian company. Those are both now available and approved. 
clearly they don't have the same uh, efficacy data uh, as the mRNA vaccines, but they're better than nothing. And they're certainly a reasonable consideration uh, to take at this point in time. And I do know some people who said months ago, I'm holding out for the plant-based vaccine and I thought you're taking a big chance, but they've actually gotten vaccinated now. So little glimmer of hope that maybe some other options will open people up to uh, alternatives if it's the mRNA itself that's the sticking point for them. That's a very good point. Absolutely. Ellen, are you friends with anybody who's not vaccinated and what are you doing or who hasn't gotten their third vaccine, I think is the better, better um, question. So I think in my the relatively small circle that I've kind of kept during the pandemic, there's a few people who haven't had a third dose, but they were people who also contracted Omicron kind of over the Christmas holidays during that big spike. And um, with NACI's recommendation that you hold off for three months after an infection before you get a third dose, I think we're going to start to see a lot of those people who are infected over the holidays start to get their third doses now. So I'm optimistic that those last few will be getting them soon. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It's, it's a question that keeps coming up with my patients is we caught Omicron in December, January. How long do we wait? Uh, I don't know, Abdu, how do you feel about three months? You know, truthfully, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that it's totally evidence-based at, at all. I, I think the idea is that there's a hope that there's going to be an innate antibody rise and you don't want to uh, unnecessarily um, you know, exploit that and, and not allow an opportunity to get that boost, if you will, at the right point in time. Um, truthfully, I, I would always say, let's look at what's going on. Uh, around us within the community and, and then determine um, when to give the, the, the dose according to what's going on. I, I don't think it's really valuable to put that stick down and say, no, it's got to be three months if you're seeing a pretty significant spike in, in uh, community prevalence around you. Um, how early? Probably no early than at least a month to six weeks, I would say. Uh, but I think that there's some room for discretion uh, between that and, and, and three months, according to the risk of the individual and what's going on around them in the community. And Omicron was a perfect example of that with our kids. You know, dad of three kids right here, I didn't wait, frankly, for eight weeks for all of them. I knew that my kids were very active. They are going to try and engage. And I didn't want to take that chance for them to get sick or, frankly, to bring it home to me and have me stay home uh, from work unnecessarily, though some people might have liked that. <laughs> Nobody would have liked that. Sure. <laughs> we need you out there. All right. Um, unanswered questions about COVID. I think we, we brought up a whole bunch of unanswered questions of what might happen in the future between the new subvariants, new variants, uh, how many doses, how many vaccines we'll need. Lots of unanswered questions. Is there anything we missed, Abdu, in terms of unanswered questions? I don't think so. I think, um, uh, you know, my, my parting advice is just be careful. Um, you know, don't, don't pay attention to the vibe because the vibe might be very misleading. I know that there's certainly a yearning for moving on. Uh, it's great to have a sense of optimism and a sense of uh, a more promising future to look forward to, but let's just be careful. You know, there's, there's no harm in being a little bit more cautious for a little while longer and being safer. Um, and, you know, hopefully the summer will be reasonable and we're not going to see enough of a, a big spike to, to, to be in trouble again in the fall. But we will be if too many people don't behave very well and consider that this is a done deal. Yeah, and I do want to bring up an anecdote. Um, you know, I think that we have countries to compare to. We mentioned Israel, South Africa, and the UK doing a lot of research. A lot of people are comparing to Denmark, which unfortunately is not doing so well right now. I was actually in Sweden about a month ago. Um, there for work, um, you know, so I arrived there the day after all of their mandates were list, lifted, everything. So no masks, no vaccine passports, nothing. Um, they were very confident that thing. And I was the only one walking around the, even the airport, the hospital with a mask. So when you were in patient care areas, you wore a mask, but when you're in the lobby, you did not wear a mask, which made me a very uncomfortable. So I wore a mask. Um, you know, I think there's differences in that population where a whole lot of them have been infected at least once. Uh, they, they were a little bit 
more open from the beginning. And also a lot more of them have gotten their third vaccine. So I think they said around 75, 80% have gotten their third vaccine of the general population and 98% of elderly people have gotten their third vaccine. So they are pretty confident, but I think that we will have a good four weeks of seeing what happens there to kind of understand what might happen here as we open up, um, but we'll have to see. In the context of Canadian research, like our cohort, we're retesting people in the spring and going into the summer with the goal of seeing if we can see more time past the third dose, starting to see some people with fourth dose antibodies to see um, if there's a dramatic difference between their fourth and the third. And again, if you see that there isn't a huge difference and maybe maybe that, that's gonna be informative too. We also had a lot more people get COVID in our cohort because of the Omicron wave. So we want to know what's the impact of breakthrough infections and if they correlate with antibody levels. We're collaborating with a lab at the University of Calgary to look at neutralizing antibodies, which is a bit more of a functional test than just the level itself. So there's a lot of more, a lot of more data that's going to come out um, in the months to come that we can share with you. And I should say, stay tuned for pediatric serology studies. Uh, there's a large national study looking at multiple immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, including IBD. And I hope to be able to give you some more information if you're interested in having your child tested for antibodies, um, you know, through the course of vaccines and even after the vaccines. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to recruit from this webinar next month. So stay tuned and we'll try to get you that information. It really, it's going to be with a, a blood spot at home for the most part. So don't have to come in for blood work or anything like that. So with that, I think we will close the webinar. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Sharkawi, for joining us. Really appreciate it. As always, very clear information. Uh, Dr. Kunzig for her insight, both from the perspective of an epidemiologist and a patient. I think that's a very unique perspective. And we're so grateful to you for providing your patient perspective to all the research we do as well, right? I think that's super important to know what's, what's of interest to patients. Um, and then obviously my partner in crime, Gil, thank you for joining again. Uh, with that, please do let us know how we did. There is a survey that goes around afterwards. A prompt will appear on your screen right after this event. Just click the link and, and fill a survey. Please give us uh, ideas of what you want to hear about the next, next uh, webinars and so on. All the information is available on the Colitis.ca website. Colitis.ca slash COVID-19 is where to get to from the top page. And then you can always see past webinars at the website as well. As always, thank you to everyone who is working hard and uh, trying to stay healthy on the front line, particularly frontline health workers who had a really tough time through uh, December and January. I know I was on service uh, and I was not on the front line of treating COVID-19, but you could see nurses getting sick and it was a really, really tough time. Um, so thank you for hanging in there and thank you for staying with the patients through all that time. Please follow us on social. And as always, if you found these webinars useful, please, please consider donations. Still no in-person <laughs> fundraising events. We're two years on now. We've had two virtual gutsy walks. We are very, very optimistic that we'll be able to do some sort of hybrid gutsy walk, some you know, non-virtual in-person outdoors, as well as online uh, virtual gutsy walk at the same time. But because these, these events have been virtual for the past two years, we've missed that, you know, that fundraising for uh, in-person events. And all of these experiences, you know, unfortunately cost money, right? We have staff supporting us. Uh, we have a website to support. We have tons of very dedicated volunteers, but we do need some funding to help provide you with this education and provide you with all the information that you've gotten over the past two years. So please considering donating by uh, texting CURE to 2222, and that will donate $25, or go to Crohn'sAcclitis.ca to donate. And with that, thank you to everybody again, and we will be back. We will answer your questions likely in about a month. So uh, good luck out there, and please stay safe.